met Maria. Um, she's been visiting us from Harvard this, this week. Uh, it's been very nice. And uh, today she will tell us about her work on scattering coefficients from monodromies. Or monodromies, depending on your, you know, Taste. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation uh, here. Uh, this is my first time in Texas. My goal uh, was twofold. One, to discuss with people here, and the second one is to get invited to the ranch at some point. So that's um, the second uh, so I will tell you uh, about uh, the scattering uh, uh, coefficients. I will be more precise in what this story is with the uh, monotonies. So <clears throat> I plan to uh, make more precise these statements. So I will be talking about black holes and scattering processes. So we'll be talking about basically the simplest uh, um, the simplest example, which is a scalar in a massless scalar, for example, in the uh, background of a black hole. So this process is um, can be set up uh, basically by any field in any black hole spacetime, and usually the process is characterized by what we call the uh, uh, scattering conditions, right? So the main idea is you have your um, <coughs> most black, uh, black hole and the scalar. Uh, so the scalar means the black hole is scattered, something goes into the black hole, something is scattered out. And so this process uh, is what we are going to talk about. So there are two things, and uh, these are the things that, uh, for which these scattering conditions are interested for. Um, so there will be the great body factors and something called the quasi-normal modes. I don't know if everyone is um, like familiar with that, so I have two slides to remind us about this. So basically, we have we will be solving some differential equations with this setup. We need to set some boundary conditions. So basically, we can place an observer at infinity, make this process. Uh, and then we see that something gets uh, reflected and transmitted, but the observer could also be placed at the horizon of the black hole, and it should uh, have the same description in, uh, from both observers. So the matrix that relates both observers um, actually contains these uh, scattering coefficients, <coughs> which are basically the transmission and reflection so the question is, how do you find those? Now, how do these um, scattering coefficients relate to what's called the gray body factors? Well, Hawking made a computation on Hawking radiation, and basically the thermal emission of, of this uh, had here this gamma per meter was just uh, one. So he got the thermal emission of this radiation, exactly this problem, and he um, was the observer here. So uh, what happened was that uh, he got the spectrum for a black boy. But as the radiation goes out, the um, black hole, there's a potential, and so the thermal emission gets shifted. So this gamma factor here is not longer one, but it will be um, directly just the module of the transmission coefficient squared, basically. And that's what we call the gray body factor. So the thermal emission will not be black, but it will be gray. So that's something uh, that is defined like that. So for finding, once we get the transmission coefficient, for example, we can compute the gray body factors. So the gray body factor is just a frequency dependent um, quantity that filters if you want the initial Hawking radiation. So this is the definition for one thing that is interesting. And I will define now the other thing that you can find, which is a different set of boundary conditions for the same problem, which define what's called the quasi-normal modes. Mary, can I ask you Yeah. So uh, back, uh, <coughs> so you say 
uh, you have a gamma which depends on the frequency, but then you write gamma is t squared. Yes. Um, the transmission and reflection coefficients will depend on the frequency of the, the uh, scalar. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's usually, so that, that's okay. So it will be a, a frequency. So the frequency of the scalar. So in the decomposition, you will see that you have the e to the i omega tau, tau is t. It is that one that goes there. Mm -hmm. It's not a constant. So, um, for quasi normal modes, there would be a frequency now that is the, no the normal frequency, but we call it the quasi normal frequency since the frequency will become uh, complex. So, basically, what we want is a boundary condition at infinity that uh, has, you know, just emission coming out from your ensemble, and on the black hole, all the information goes in and there's nothing coming out. So this uh, now will not have, um, this, this uh, boundary conditions will not have the same matrix here, but we will have special values for the transmission and reflection coefficients. So basically, if we set um, the transmission coefficient uh, to become infinity, that will give us exactly this uh, boundary condition. So if we have the scattering uh, coefficient, so the transmission or reflection coefficient, we can also determine the quasi normal modes in a very simple way. And I will show you an example here. So the quasi normal modes are the characteristic oscillations of these black holes and have complex uh, frequencies and uh, are associated with decay times of perturbations. And usually, uh, quasi normal modes appear in dissipative uh, systems, and this ensemble with the black hole and the scalar is one. So uh, there are characteristic um, uh, frequencies that you can find. So for these two things, uh, we are interested always in finding these higher coefficients. So why should we be interested in them, you know, I'm coming here, most of the people are more interested in my screen aspects. Black holes are thermal objects, and so we know that a lot of ideas have been, uh, in, you know, uh, dealing with entropy country, right? The black hole has an entropy, blah, blah, blah. But um, we know also that there's a relation between what the great body factors are and we interpret that as the deep brain emission rate. So for computing, although I will be just doing a GR computation, it has some um, interpretation in string theory. And the second thing that has to do with uh, quasi normal frequencies is that they yield the prediction on thermalization time scales in dual uh, 2 d CFTs, for example, for the cases of BBC. So we have also an interpretation of the casinoma modes and could be interesting for stringy aspects. I will not talk about the string theory interpretation. I will go back to the GR computation and tell you some things that over the last 40 years have not been you know, computed and um, tell you what, what is so complicated in this uh, GR problem that uh, is um, actually um, preventing us for, for, to have an explicit um, exact analytical solution for this uh, transmission or reflection coefficients or the plus and minus. So, okay. So what equations are we going to talk today about? Uh, we're going to take just the Klein volume equation, so the wave equation for masses. Everything that I'm saying can be applied to massive black, uh, massive scalars or spins or black holes uh, scalars with other spins and so on. Um, so the story is that if you take this equation and use the pair black hole in four dimensions, Tokolsky showed that in 73 <coughs> that this equation is separable. 
And that was kind of impressive. No one thought that was actually the case. So you take here, you Boyer Linquist, and you get a separable equation. So then other people started trying to solve the problem um, because they couldn't find a way to do it analytically, and we'll see more details on that. So some other people tried to use approximate um, solution to mix uh, analytical, like take WQB models and so on to find these uh, things. Um, and then the most established and the way that people usually compute, for example, for normal modes is with this um, continued fraction representation of the normal modes developed by Lieber. Uh, this is a method that at the end one needs to uh, do things numerically. So the only way to solve the pure black hole scattering problem is basically finally numerically. So the problem of finding this uh, transmission and reflection coefficients is a problem that hasn't been solved. So the idea we had, um, I'm, I'm talking about a couple of papers I did with Alejandra Castro, now in Amsterdam, and Alex Maloney and Josh Lappen, was why is this problem so difficult that we can't find it's the GR problem of the scattering of the, you know, massless scalar in care four dimensions. We have separable equations, so we have we will be dealing with all the years. So what's making what what is the complication and why can't we have a formula for that. What about in Schwarzschild? Is it solvable there? Um, yeah. No, Schwarzschild has the same problem. And I will show you that from the perspective of uh, trying to see what the structure of the differential equation is, uh, it is very simple to see that uh, actually it, it, it will have the same problem as care. What, what will happen is that uh, the ODs contain uh, not all the singularities are regular singularities, and I will just briefly mention what they are. The problem is that asymptotically flat black holes, the R equals infinity um, um, you know, a point is actually an irregular singularity, and that changes everything. So every time that we have a black hole that is asymptotically flat, the differential equation will have is a regular singularity, which complicates the story and will prevent us from solving the problem. So, as I said, then these equations and um, many similar uh, things have been shown can be uh, understood in certain limits. So, for low frequencies, we have um, formulas and a good understanding, and for large frequencies. There are some approximations also coming from this. So the questions were, can we do better? So why can't we solve for all the ranges <coughs> of the frequencies? And um, why, why is the problem so complicated? So the <coughs> idea was to use the most fancy mathematics, which was to use complex analysis on the differential equations. At least that's it, as fancy as I can get. Um, and try to see there if we could understand it, the structure, a little bit more to see what was going on. Yeah? What is dissipated in that equation, the primary equation? Isn't the metric everything real? Don't you have a self joint operator? Yes, but um, it's true, but the frequencies can still have uh, imaginary um, you know, solutions. So that's, that's the, if, if you constrain to frequencies that are only real, then you will not have any dissipative um, process. But the frequencies can have also complex values. And that's so this is something like looking at resonances? Yeah, it is, it is like that, yes. Yeah. So um, I mentioned some things of um, the setup. I plan now to show you um, Examples of the wave equations, because if I go on and just tell you about the monotonous uh, techniques that we develop, you will fall asleep. And then um, I will try to tell you that we found some cute formulas 
And it seems that actually if you use what's called the monodromies um, as a variable for this problem, we can get uh, cute formulas that are very simple. So the alphas here, if one has a differential equation with three regular singular points, these alphas here represent the monodromies. I will show you they're very simple um, expressions for care, for example, and um, some other examples. So we know exactly how to compute um, either the transmission and reflection coefficients. So by analyzing the type of regular, the singularity, sorry, of the differential equation, we can uh, find these monodromies, plug them in, and just use this formula. But if, the, if you have a regular and irregular singularities of the differential equation, we can also write a formula, but we will have some unknowns here that we cannot determine with this, uh, um, with this computation that I will show you today. Uh, Josh uh, Lappin and McGill, some other students, and Alex are actually working out some other ways of trying to compute this. So although I will not tell you the whole story, um, I, will tell, I will focus more on this here. I will tell you how we got this formula, but uh, will not, you know, this is ongoing work on how to compute then these uh, missing things for uh, equations that do have regular and irregular similarities. So the full problem for care will fall into this category. Any problem like BTC or subtractive geometries or um, any other thing that has these regular singularities like the approximate um, frequencies will fall here. Um, but I, I want to show you how the technique is applied and hopefully Alex or uh, Josh can visit and tell you about how to um, find and solve the problem. So how do the wave equations look like? So this is care. Um, here the, we have capital M for the mass. This is a usual for here thing because A is the angular momentum of the black hole. So if we use this metric here and use uh, this ansatz for the scalar, we see that um, what the t and phi directions are basically solved we get two equations. So these are the separable equations I was talking about. Um, this is the spheroidal equation. So the KLs are known. One should go to Abramovitz table and find them and use them here. So they are the uh, eigenvalues of the spheroidal equation. So we are left with a radial equation that we need to solve. And how, how do we do that? So these are the two equations for care. If you take the radial uh, equation, it becomes an OE. And so uh, there are two horizons for the black hole. There's a, uh, the largest root and the smallest root of, um, so I'm, I'm just taking this, I call it the, it's the event horizon, which is the largest, high, uh, largest root. Um, this is the event horizon or outer event horizon because R minus will, will be the inner uh, horizon. And so what, what we can see is actually that this uh, differential equation has two regular singular points. So we can kind of see that from this coefficient here, that if R is R plus, this blows up. So there's a similarity there. If r is equals r minus, we have also another similar point. And if we change variables or do the analysis at infinity, we see that also there's some blowing ups that um, happen here. Uh, uh, but this uh, irregular singular, this point at infinity will be irregular. And I will show you what the problem is and why we differentiate this. And this is not just the labeling of you know, what these similarities are. So basically, black holes in four dimensions that are symptomatically flat will have three singularities. They, it happens that the wave equation has them at the inner, outer, and, and infinity points. And um, 
this is what we observe. So um, the solutions for this equation, if we make an expansion around one of the similarities, we see that we can expand in this way. So we find um, that actually it is like r minus r plus to a certain power. And this power over here is the monotony. It is the, the uh, constants that I show you in the formula that we need. They have, of course, a more precise definition as just this. But any time we, we approach uh, a regular singular point, the solution will have this sort of expansion. And so we can find what alpha plus and minus the monotonies are um, for, for uh, this r plus and r minus, and they look like this. So they're very simple uh, things. M here is not the mass. This is the mass, so they depend on the frequency. They will depend on the mass also of the black hole and A. But M is the eigenvalue of the um, astrolutho. Um, so I will be talking about conjugacy classes of these monogramies and so on. So this is the way to see them. And you see how uh, we put these values here and how to relate them to, to the complex analysis um, story. But I wanted to show you more or less what the computations are. So what happens at infinity for a pair? Well, it is, I I'm keep on saying it, it is the irregular single point. So basically, if we make an expansion at infinity <coughs> of the solution, it's not longer r to a certain power. It has this e to the i omega um, r power. And this means that the series is not longer uh, a convergent series, but it will be it, it will be a non-convergent series. So that's the difference between making an expansion uh, on a regular or an, or an irregular point uh, on, on the space. And so what happens is that if we want to compute uh, now the monogamy around this irregular point, we cannot pick directly this lambda that appears here or there's a, to, to find a monogamy, one has to do a more complicated thing. And so to find finally the alpha irregularity there, uh, because this is an irregular singular point, something else happens, which is called the Stokes phenomenon. And one has to do a lot of more complicated computations. So uh, this alpha and lambda, are they the same? or? R to no. the lambda looks so, like the alpha in the field. Yeah, so lambda oh. here for ah, pair, so for example, this is what what usually uh, we say that this, or the definition in math, is that this is the formal monogram. Mm -hmm. So for care, it's just 2m omega. But actually, it is um, the, the um, monogamy at infinity, uh, which is the true monogamy, if you want, will be this more complicated thing. And it has some constants here that are determined um, by this, what's called the Stokes matrices. If I have time, I will show you all the details, but the idea today is not to show you all that because you will like, get lost in translation. Um, it was kind of to show you the difference between this uh, irregular and uh, regular that. So there's an additional complication of the issue of having these irregular singular points. Basically, this constant, uh, roughly speaking, is that depending on which uh, direction in the complex plane you approach infinity, you will have wedges of your space in which one of the two solutions, because these are second order or these, are um, more um, relevant than the other wedges. So it will depend on the direction in which you approach uh, infinity. That's usually what happens. So to glue these solutions in these patches, you have some constants. And these constants are C0 or C minus 1. And so how do you determine those? Uh, you, you do this, this is called the Stokes phenomenon. 
uh, there's, there's a very precise uh, way to compute them. So, okay, uh, we have this problem then. Um, and but now I want to compare with um, another solution. So there's this um, metric that mm, some people like and some people don't like very much, which are called the subtractive care geometry. So Finn and Miriam found some solutions and then uh, Gary and uh, Miriam actually um, realized that um, they were basically some solutions in STU models. So the difference between care and this solution is that you replace the usual um, epsilon here by this other complicated function. And the, the black hole that you have is not longer asymptotically flat. It will have some other kind of asymptotics. We don't care. But it has the same entropy and same angular momentum, uh, sorry, uh, angular velocity and temperature that uh, the care black hole. And so uh, they called it subtracted in the sense that you kind of chop the asymptotically flat part of your black hole. So, and, and, and you can just do that by replacing this function in, in the metric. There's no way to wiggle the parameters of this to get back to care. No, no they are not uh, linked. So, um, at least we haven't found a way to connect the solutions. That probably if you use generating methods, you know, that could be used to link them, there, there could be some additional parameters, but no, there's no way in which I can change M and A at least and go from one solution to the other. So what happens here? Well, the equations are much simpler. They're separable. Uh, the equation is not, not just spheroidal, but you get the typical Legendre kind of um, um, things for theta. And then the, this is basically just a change of coordinates they uh, do. So r is, not, is changed to x, but I wanted to show you this equation to see that actually now the um, inner and outer event horizons that are kept in the same position, the only thing is infinity now, um, the changes will be at x equals uh, minus <coughs> one half or plus one half. So basically this equation here is showing you that there will be a singularity also at the inner horizon and at the outer horizon. And there are these constants here. And these constants will be the, the monogamy space. <coughs> but the interesting part is that doing this chopping of space, they chopped part of the differential equation that had the irregular singular point. And this, this was very important because if you do that, then I could just simply use the formula I showed you at the beginning with the synges and go and compute the transmission and reflection coefficients. So now the monogramies, the alphas that appear there will be this here, that will be the same as for care, but the monogramy at infinity is not longer the uh, monogramies in alpha irregularity, it will be just L times L plus one. And so if I use that directly into my um, you know, formula for the transmission coefficients, where now alpha one, alpha two, and alpha three are the monogamy at the, inner, at the outer, inner, and, and infinity, uh, the, the horizons, and at infinity, we can use that and find the gray boy factors. Another thing I can do is that um, I can find the quasi-normal modes. And so just simply setting this to zero, which makes the blowing up of the transmission coefficient, defines the quasi-normal modes. So either we can do that by either setting this to zero or this to zero, and we find the two sets of quasi-normal frequencies. In a more fancy way, in a paper that appeared um, one month ago, 
Miriam and um, Gary actually computed the same frequencies without using our formula. And um, there's another way of doing it. Basically, you have to solve the equation. But what I'm going to, and what we want to stress is that there's no need actually to solve the equation. You can basically look at where the singularities of your operator are. You can compute the monotomies and just use the definitions here and uh, get any uh, quasi normal frequency that you want or the gray part. So, okay. Um, so, so the formula that relates R and T to the alphas, is that the general formula? Yeah. Uh, it works for, I'm, I'm talking about black holes in particular, but any uh, differential equation, ODE, mm -hmm. that contains three regular singular mm -hmm. points can have, you know, you can define the monotomies and mm -hmm. can be used to compute this mm -hmm. quantity if you're interested in it's like quantum mechanics. Yeah, exactly. Any, any problem that you find that mm -hmm. fits in this kind of um, ODE will, will have that as a function. So, okay, so how do we do the magic? For, um, so this is called the monogamy theory. So the basic idea is you take your differential equation or Frank Gordon equation and find uh, some PDAs for your problem and set some boundary conditions. So the boundary conditions are an important uh, issue here. And uh, we see that, uh, we will see that the, the properties of the analytical properties of the solutions can be useful to compute the scattering process. So I will do some more formal kind of um, representation of what I told you in these two examples now. So on one hand, we have the, the Pythagorean equation, and we are going to be dealing with problems in which this equation is separable. For example, there are a lot of cases for uh, this equation here, if we generalize it, for example, of a massless scalar in a black ring background, we haven't found a way to split it. So we know examples that are not separable, but in the cases that are separable, we can take just the ODEs and represent them in kind of a matrix uh, compact form. So you will take uh, U here, so Z will be R over theta. So U will be in the part that contains the differential, uh, the derivatives, and B is like the potential. So we can just define um, a matrix A that contains the information of this second order differential equation. And we can write this as a system of two coupled first order differential equations. So this is the way we will do that. This is just notation. So I was reminding you that, for example, for here, you can take either this one or this one, use U will be just the delta, and V will be this other bit here. So we can do that and um, define this matrix A. And then on the column here, well, these are not the two different solutions of the differential <coughs> equation. You just use one of the solutions and U times the partial derivative of the other one. And so you have um, a column that looks like this, and so if you just uh, work it out, you get back to the second order uh, equation. But we can uh, do more fancy things and put not just one column, but the other column with the second solution for that. And so we will call this the fundamental matrix. And just relabeling things to play around to a more, more abstract thing, the same problem. So, um, this matrix will be invertible, which uh, just tells us that the two solutions of the second order differential equation is uh, linearly independent. So now we will go and try to play around in the complex plane. So I will complexify, for example, the R um, variable for, for care and go to that. And um, to only deal with uh, 
operators that are meromorphic at certain points. So meromorphic is an isolated points in the complex plane in which the operator blows up. This will be the inner, outer, and infinity points in the problem we will try to solve. So if we go to the complex plane and we have a solution, if we go around it, we will end up with this other new solution. So basically, if we go around a pole, and this is you know complex analysis, usually you can get um, the same uh, solution. So if you have this operator um, that um, is the differential operator, and we have the new solution, this new solution will be a solution of, or, or will be annihilated by this operator. If we multiply on the right, and we are operating from the left, by a constant matrix, that's basically it. So this matrix M uh, gamma here is what it's called the monogamy matrix. That's basically uh, what what we are t I was talking about. And so it will contain the information that we need. In particular, um, okay, the we can choose some uh, special gauge. So we we go to um, some coordinate system and see that uh, whenever we go around, a, a, not a pole, but just you know any other point in your plane, we will have that the monogamy matrix is just the identity because we are not enclosing or going around any of those poles. So the implication for, for that is actually that um, the, the monogamies whether they are just the identity or not the identity, will tell us that um, there are some branch points of the solutions. So we can identify which kind of uh, problems these points will have depending on the value of the monogamy matrix, whether it is enclosing some hole or not. So if we have uh, there's a property on these monogamy matrices. If we have the whole complex plane and we have sets and poles and we are enclosing each of these poles here, the product of the monogamies, because on the outside we are left with no, no um, pole, on the right hand side we should get the identity, but if we multiply these matrices, um, we, we are going to have the identity. So this is how we will use that equation over there to relate information from one point <coughs> to the other. And that's why we're going to be able to write this formulas of, um, for this pattern coefficients. So the individual matrices can be computed just because of this equation. And it relates information that is local to something that is global. And it can be helpful then to compute this scattering coefficients. So um, what Miriam and Gibbons, or whoever did so far the computations, well, there's some other works by uh, Nitzke and so on, where they're using uh, these definitions of the monogamies to compute the quasi-normal mode. So we were not the first people to do some computations with it. But basically, all the uh, work that's done is uh, they're solving the equations. They're finding, actually, the solutions of the weight equation. But uh, instead of looking at where these branch points are, what we are seeing is that we can look directly to the poles of the, um, of the operator. And so um, we can uh, choose uh, a way to see what kind of hole it has directly by looking at the operator. Uh, if we make an expansion of the uh, operator on the points that we suspect are the poles, we see that we can find whether they are regular or irregular depending on the coefficient that we will have here. So if r is just zero, the point will be a pole, and it will be a regular similar point if r is larger than zero, then we know as infinity is for asymptotically flat, flat black holes that uh, we have an irregular. 
So yes, this matrix A, which group does it belong to? Is it GL2R or GL2C sort of I'm, what gauge? Uh, you can draw, right? That's what you mean by gauge transformation. It's not coordinate change. It's not changing Z. No. Z. It's really yeah. gauge transformation. I, I don't know if, if we can um, if we can uh, analyze all the A's or your rest restrictings to some group in particular. I, 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 we haven't done the analysis to which group they correspond to. In the case of Kerr, I mean, what would be? The what? The Kerr yes. uh, problem that you mm -hmm. started on. What would it be in that case, this group? Uh, the group? I, I'm not sure what it, what it is. I, I don't remember. I'm not sure we put it in those terms. But probably, um, yeah, I don't remember that. Could we see the equation again to see what A is? For yes. Where it comes in? Um, let me just. just this, and then VR is all the rest. <coughs> okay. So that's the uh, for care how it looks like. Excuse me. Yes. Can they the usually the the bird irregular used for exponential singularities or something like that? So I was I'm a bit confused but you would when already you call the second order fold, you would already call it irregular singularity. When, when you say uh, exponential? Like e to the minus, uh, no, sorry. Well, because it's essential. 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 Yeah. Essential. essential. Ah, essential. Yeah. essential. It means just square root or something. Square root, yeah. 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 OK, yeah. Thanks. And, and is there, would there be a way if you have second order folds to somehow separate? Uh, that I mean to try to perturb um, your problem in such a way that you separate it in and then it, it could be there are a lot of other you know kind of more complicated problems that one can solve so if the you mean if the rank so the order of the singularity instead of being the first order fold uh, it is like a second order fold or yeah, and then, uh, yeah. oh no, but if you separate it, then you get one more singularity, and then you don't have three, but four. Four. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, okay, do, do you want me to write the kind of No, what I'm really trying to understand is what a gauge transformation yeah. means in this context. Mm -hmm. This is just a, a similarity transformation by a matrix that might make <coughs> uh, R. Mm -hmm. Try to, try to simplify this matrix by changing basis in the two-dimensional space of each Yes. One. So the monogamies are values that do not depend on the coordinate. It's, it's not or the definition. So I'm, I'm not sure if uh, from the group transformation I really know how to define it so far. So, so you just multiply your psi vector or phi, mm -hmm. sorry, by g, g inverse and a equals to with a inhomogeneous term. Yes. It's just a gauge transform. Yeah. 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 And you're using special group elements to play. Yes. Okay. So, um, okay. I will just, I'm sorry for this. The group is GL2. Yeah, yeah. It's in GL2R or C major. Is this some simple potential? I mean, the type example, if you would teach quantum mechanics, what would you use? I mean, well, illustrate all usually, this. Usually the potentials either in, in 
quantum mechanics either go to zero in infinity or in this potential, if you if you make a plot of that, yeah, it, it has some similarities, but then it will not go to zero. Uh -huh. That's basically if you want to understand it like Schrodinger or like if you would like to torture your students with some complicated Well, problem, they will not be able to Is there some type example, simple, classical yeah. example of so, Stokes did something? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so the the way to solve that is, you know, usually you would solve at infinity and then you will solve close to the horizon and then match the solutions. That's that's the way in which but when you do that you have to give up to solve it exactly. You will have to give me um, you know, something has to be small, mm -hmm. and usually it is the omega times a or omega times m in the equation. So that that is something that we can do. But we give up the, the story about trying to do that for any uh, value. So oh, this is an overlapping matching region. Yeah, so you have to choose one of the per to to make any matching. You need always a scale that has to be very small, so that you can have two different uh, sets. Of Okay, so, okay, at first I was talking about the singularities, they seemed artificial, but now we see that actually they involve um, a lot of other things. So, um, one, one can actually understand how this computation can be done for the regular singular points, and uh, there's a complication if we go to the regular singular points. So I will only talk um, about now for the regular singular points. So we can um, just find the monodromies uh, in this way and find the uh, matrices that we need. And um, the matrices will have uh, different uh, eigenvalues. And so if we make an expansion now on the solution, we see that uh, if you make the expansion in Taylor expand around this, uh, the monodromies, equivalence class for this monotony are just these exponents here. So this is the way one can do that. Um, so now when, when, when you choose a set of solutions in this way, the solutions can be diagonal if you choose a proper base. And explicitly what this uh, is telling us is defining for kind of the physics problem now, what is ingoing and outgoing. So in the pictures I had at the beginning, I was throwing something that was going into the black hole or out the outside to from the black hole. So if we, we have like R minus R plus, if you change to tortoise coordinates, you will have the usual e to the mi minus omega, whatever, you know, with the velocity that will tell you whether the plane wave is ingoing or outgoing. So we are using the R that is not the tortoise, so the way to see it is just directly by looking at this and seeing that um, it is a diagonal uh, matrix. Uh, so this is, this is just a choice, uh, a choice of uh, basis, um, and uh, when you're doing this computation, you have to choose the basis and uh, try to find uh, what how to link this information uh, on the two points. And so basically what we are defining, so the matrix that uh, will be the change of phases uh, will contain the information on this monotony. So this is the way in which uh, we are going to find the now the connection to the transmission and infection coefficients um, for uh, the problem. So, um, well, there's there's something that we have not mentioned, which is that any base that you choose uh, has some normalizations, and these are arbitrary in the problem. And for the case here, we we can see that actually this d1 and d2, d3, d4 are the normalization parameters, and so we can use any of those. In particular, if you choose uh, one in which the transformation matrix belongs to uh, SU uh, 1 comma 1, we see that uh, there, the, there's no ambiguity in which uh, 
this normalization is coming down. And in particular, you will get just uh, the definitions that we had at the beginning of the, the transmission and reflection coefficients. So um, I, I told you about the monodromy matrices and how to relate them to the boundary, con uh, boundary conditions. And in a hand wavy way, I told you how to find the uh, eigenvalues of the monodromies to go to the formula. So for any problem that contains at most three, but it can also have two uh, regular singular points, um, we can find a set of monodromy matrices in the same basis and use uh, the product of the three uh, being equal to one. And in that set, we can find what these monodromy matrices are. This is just a choice. We can also you know, change them. So alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3 are the equivalent class of the. So it's a very, it's a set of um, uh, two-dimensional uh, matrices. And so now to get to the formula, if we just find the change of basis between two of these uh, points, we can now find the uh, formula, so we just equate M2 to 1 directly and link it to the definitions that we want for physics. And this is the way to write this formula. So it seems that somehow the transmission and reflection coefficient contain information uh, that is very uh, simple to write if we take the monodromies as the you know, parameters that we kind of instead of you know using the parameters of the black hole itself and the frequencies and so on. But that expression is not that different. If you were doing this just by looking at the standard one function description. Oh no, it's the same. Yeah. So in what sense? Well it seems that the, the monotony is the same or is the same answer. Yeah, but the the monotony seem like more natural parameters to describe the Problem, not A and N and blah blah blah. It's just a parameter kind of. Either you use R plus and R minus to describe your black hole or A and M, it's the same black hole, right? I guess one thing that I maybe you know, I'm missing, I probably missing the point, but it, it sounded like you were saying that um, the Miriam Gehrig in this way of solving it would require solving the entire way equation and doing the solution everywhere. Yes, but you have so, to. But that's essentially what you're doing by extracting monodromies. No, because the monodromies can be extracted from the differential equation. You don't need to go and solve the. You, you can just by looking at the operator, you can find what the monodromies are. You don't need to make the expansion of the Miriam and the Well, there we are doing it. It just. It may seem similar. So simple, you know, you're expanding the solutions about the boundary. That's certainly not as hard. It's not a hard application. Well, they wrote the PRL like paper, so it seems that it is. It must be I don't know. It seems that it's uh, for that computation of the quasi normal modes. The, it seems, I, I, for me, it's a trivial thing. I don't find it so. Um, fascinating if you want. And just saying that it's not necessary to go and find all the quasi-normal modes or you know any black hole that has three singularities. We know already that it, you can find the quasi-normal modes by just, you know, either doing by Miriam's technique or this, this is an alternative if you want uh, to doing that. It's just a different analysis if you want. Just like, I mean, there are three monotony matrices, their product is one, mm -hmm. and each matrix has an alpha in it. So there are like three alphas with one constraint, so how can there be three independent alphas? It's just very naive. Um, there's alpha one, alpha two, alpha three. There are one. different eigenvalues, right, mm -hmm. of each of the matrices. Mm -hmm. And the constraints don't fix? No, they don't fix. Okay. They're not, there's no link between them, although 
know the product is equals to one. Yeah. They're independent. Um, Miriam had uh, comments on, you know, doing it this way. And I think that, you know, um, for my understanding of the story, this is like, uh, you know, you can use complex analysis if you want, or you can do and play, you know, a lot, like a lot with the equations and just solve them. That's what you're doing. No, no, I was it's just, I was under the impression that you were saying that they, were, they needed to solve them everywhere. Well, I think they only need to solve them as a problem. Yeah, they, they need, they they need to uh, just do the matching of that, right? right they need to solve. It's not as hard as having to solve them everywhere. That's, that was the only problem. I, th I don't need to, s yeah, that's true. They don't need to solve it everywhere. They can't solve it everywhere. That's but a, usually, that's a you know, boundary inspection is easy to do and your rise is easy to do. That's fine. You have to find uh, a proper, this is, the alphas are independent of the coordinate, uh, you know, representation. They have to go and find a set of coordinates in which they understand what ingoing sure. and outgoing is. Um, it is very simple for the cases they're analyzing. In some cases, it's not that trivial. And it, I think it gives the same thing, just another way of seeing this. Can we have the degeneracy of uh, causal normal Um From here or in the page? In, in, in Norway and in Canada. Um, I think you can find all the causal normal in this way, yes. But um, I'm not sure. Given the element M, can you tell me the, there are how many nodes correspond to the How many quasi-normal nodes there are? They correspond to the same element M, labeled by the same element Yeah, you can, you can do that analysis. You can find the general formula for them. Yeah. Either method works. The other one is like more of quantum mechanics form of doing this. This is using uh, complex analysis. So, um, okay, then there were a lot of uh, other problems, and basically one of the problems is what you do with uh, uh, infinity, and so there's a lot of drama there. Um, I have, like, uh, I think my time is really running out. So, um, I, my, my idea was, you know, to tell you uh, what was going on and how to see that things are more complicated when you're dealing with the irregulars on a point. So, and I will not go through that because of the time, but basically uh, there's a lot of other stuff that is going on that we can, you know, there's this issue of the Stokes phenomenon on how to, find the monogamous and infinity. Um, and so I, I will not talk about it now. Um, so, um, we found, let me just say this. Um, so we found two ways of computing the uh, monogamy at these irregular similar we found an analytical way to do it by making an expansion, uh, which is you know going around more or less the same point, and we can perturbatively find the expressions for the uh, monogamies at the uh, irregular similar point. Um, a paper by Lowe and collaborators a few months ago, also with some other uh, way of analyzing similarities and symmetries of the wave equation find on the same uh, monogamy. Um, and there's a numerical way to do it also, if you uh, want. So these are just the curves for the irregular monogamy for care. Um, the dots are the numerical things, and this is the analytical approximate way that we have for some special values of the mass and the angular momentum and Ellen and the image. Just to say that. And, um, so 
Let me just conclude. talked about this pattern problem, uh, the similarities, and some analytical other ways of computing the things, uh, the scattering and perfection coefficients. Um, but um, we, we, a lot of remains to be done. I think we understand now in a more formal way what the problem with the equations are and why this problem was unsolved for 40 years. Uh, I'm not claiming we solved it. And we still uh, there. So, thanks. Thank you. So, more questions over here? Just for me to understand mathematically, if you have one of these operators, mm -hmm. the number of uh, regular points, of uh, singular points, and their range is an invariant. You cannot no. change the operator uh, yes. in any way. To change the number of singularities or the rank of the singularity. Yes, it's an invariant. And the monodromies are also invariant of your operator. It will not depend on uh, any change that you make. Yes. When you put a scatter in the graph, or by one, the, will they form some kind of bubble state? Like the quantum system, you have a uh, yeah. whale. Mm -hmm. Have scattering states. Yes. Mm -hmm. Spunk states. I think that you you will have to see you know which kind of potential you have. It is the same problem. You know it it is exactly or, or the or same. Out, uh, I I don't remember. We can go and plot. That would take me like two seconds. You know, on the computer, and we can look at the potentials. I I don't remember. I don't know if anyone remembers that. Uh, you said something about the, back, uh, the, the appearance of the irregular similarities mm -hmm. has something to do with the back background. Yes. So the, is that a com common thing? Like, I mean, if you change the background, uh, other similarities appear? So for example, if you had a black hole on ADS background, the ADS has, you know, let's, let's think just only about ADS. Um, that will turn the singularity and infinity um, to have two singularities, which are be will become regular singularities. And so the, the way to see it from the math per perspective is that whenever you take, for example, the cosmological constant to infinity, L, these two regular singularities will meet, and they will generate this irregular singularity. So but you, when you take ADS pair or Schwarzschild, you will have the two points you know, that are either in the in, inner or outer event horizon or at the center of the Schwarzschild, so R equals to zero and the event horizon. They have the same category that the ones for pair. And for ADS, you will have not three singularities, but you will have two more. So the wave equation for ABS care or ABS Schwarzschild will contain four regular singularities. And so when you want to go to the flat limit, these two regular singularities at infinity coincide in the same point, which is R infinity, and it becomes this irregular singularity. So you have, you're giving up, you know, something for your training. Yeah. So, this is pretty neat uh, trick, but besides obtaining the translation coefficient, what other information, what other applications is there to classify them with the monotony of the solution? Well, I, um, I don't see a practical other application directly from the monotonies that we could use, but maybe there can be some. For me, the, the idea of, you know, um, the, the purpose was originally to find a formula so that we don't have to go and solve, you know, quasi-normal modes or whatever by numerical methods or whatever. And I thought the problem was much simpler and we would be able to do it. So I was focusing on that and not trying to see other applications. Um, I, 
I haven't uh, found some higher applications that they can do within this context. So you can uh, observe outside the horizon through the scatter field to the black hole. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the scatter field gets scattered and the observer will uh, receive it. Yes. So the time interval between sending and receiving, this uh, time uh, for the observer is uh, finite or infinite? I, I think that's a different question than just, you know, what what is the proper time you mean of the observer of receiving? And I think that's a different um, question. It doesn't have to do with you know, you have to define an observer where he's sitting the proper time. So, say the observer is uh, uh, sitting. If it's in, at uh, infinity, it will, take, it will take infinite time. So, uh, say the observer is uh, uh, having a fixed uh, radio distance from the black hole. And it will voice. depend how far away you are from it or not. This is a GR computation that you can really do and, you know, place your observer and see define a proper time and how much time it will take you. It will depend in the space if you're not at infinity and how big or large your black hole is. Yes. But if the distance is uh, not at infinity, so my time should not be infinity. Right? Or, yeah, it, it will be something, but it will depend on how big your black hole is and where you are. Okay. Yes. Anything else? All right, well, let's thank Maya again. Thank you.